Welcome to Safety Talk. Personal safety expert Pete Canavan shares his insights and interviews experts who provide simple and effective tips, techniques, and technologies to keep you safe and secure both online and off. Here's Pete. Hello, and welcome to Safety Talk. I am your host and personal safety expert, Pete Canavan, and I'm joined by my colleague, branding and social media expert, Neil Haley. Neil, how are you today? I'm, gonna, I'm doing great, Pete. I'm not going to talk about the uh, disturbance that just occurred. There was situational awareness, and I was able to, to stop the, pers- the, uh, the flying object from destroying and hurting me and the show tonight. There you go. It must be training by osmosis through the, the, yeah. the ether here. <laughs> yes, definitely. Good, good. Well, we're glad it's all good. So what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about a couple of uh, current news items. And there, you know, every week there's always a bunch of stuff. And I try to pick a few things that are really of paramount importance. And so we're going to touch on a couple of them. And the first is a real somber reminder today that threats from foreign nations continue to illustrate the need for, you know, really decisive response from the United States. And what has happened today is that there was an Iranian threat to American troops today, and it prompted actually the deployment of an aircraft carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln and its strike force, uh, as well as a bomber task force to the Middle East today. And so that's kind of scary. And, you know, it really underscores the, the danger that continues to, you know, exist from the Islamic Republic. And so basically it was deployed today as the result of what they have described as a, quote, clear indicator that the Iranians and other forces were preparing for possible attack on U.S. troops in the region. And so, you know, there are other hostilities going in, you know, in the region as well. You know, every time we turn around, there's something else going on. We saw this past weekend, there was a crazy exchange of missiles and rockets between Israel and Palestinian militants on the Gaza Strip. The militants fired about over 600 rockets into Israel. Mm -hmm. And in retaliation, Israel shot off over 250 airstrikes against these militants. And so the Middle East just continues to be a hotbed. It continues to harbor all kinds of hostilities. And things seem to be escalating. And it's a really scary world, especially out in the Middle East region. So we all have to be vigilant. We have to keep an eye on this because these things are... They can affect every one of us. And sometimes we think, well, you know, it's happening on the other side of the world. But, you know, what happens if you have a, a member of the military that's on one of those ships, you know, or a member of the, those, uh, you know, troops that are over there? Uh, or you're traveling to the region or you're just, you know, worried about things and maybe they could spill over into, you know, Israel communities in this country, in the United States or in elsewhere around the world. So these are things that we all have to keep an eye on. So, I mean, that's kind of the first and the most disturbing, you know, piece of news that's happened the, over the last couple of days. Uh, the second is that there was a man out in California who decided that he, after getting into an argument with some people in a state park, that he was just going to turn around and shoot people. And so five people were shot. Nobody was killed, at least not yet. I guess they're, in, you know, not good condition, critical condition. But, you know, that serves as a reminder to people, too, that, you know, we've got to be aware of the fact that you never know who you're dealing with. You never know who that person is that you're arguing with. And you don't know whether or not they have a gun and whether or not they even intend to use it. And so you might get into an argument with somebody and think nothing of it. And next thing you know, the person's pulling a gun out and he's shooting you and your family. So please, everybody, you have to take certain things and really it underscores the importance of understanding your surroundings and being aware of the people around and the potential for all sorts of conflicts. Now, in the realm of physical safety, our guest today is somebody who, like myself, is a martial artist and all about physical safety and self-defense. Uh, Peter Hunigman is the founder and head instructor of a company called Best Defense Concepts. Uh, he is also a practicing attorney. And he has been studying martial arts in the self-defense since the mid-1980s. So he has a background in several martial arts uh, with a focus in Kempo, Karate, and uh, Krav Maga, as well as Hapkido, which is something that I have been studying for a long, long time. So, you know, we've done a lot of these shows uh, about online safety and cybersecurity and things of that nature. And, you know, with one of my passions being self-defense in the martial arts, I'm excited to bring on a fellow martial artist to the show today. So... Welcome to Safe Talk, Peter. Thanks for being on the show with us. Pete, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 
Absolutely. We're, we're Absolutely. Here. Yes. Pete and Pete on the show. I guess I'm going to, I lost my job for being late tonight. Uh, it's just going to be the Pete and Pete <laughs> show. Hey, they can just run the, the uh, safety show, but uh, it's great to have you both on. At least I won't forget the name. There you go. <laughs> no, uh, I think that's your middle name today, Neil. <laughs> uh, you know, anything that can be done to improve, uh, you know, safety is what we're all about here on Safety Talk. And, you know, we always seek out different solutions to those issues that, you know, really affect every single one of us in one way or another at some point in our lives. And so, Peter, you and I have been studying martial arts for a long time, and I think you'd agree that it's really important that everybody know some type of self-defense, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think the everybody needs to have a basic, at least a baseline, and there's so many people that come to my seminars seem to have no experience whatsoever, which is fine, but so many more people won't bother to come at all and you wonder why that is and I think a little bit of that is just kind of burying your head in the sand hoping hoping things aren't going to ever turn bad you won't ever need those skills as opposed to being prepared in case something happens yeah and you know one of the things that I've learned uh, and I found it's very important to impart to those that have an interest in learning some type of self-defense is shattering the myth that it has to take years of study in order to you know become uh, you know adept or at least get to some level of proficiency with being able to protect yourself from, you know, some sort of physical attack because simply knowing some basic concepts, uh, knowing some basic techniques and practicing them regularly uh, really can make anybody a force to be reckoned with in a very short period of time. It doesn't necessarily take years and years of study. Right. Um, And, you know, it's something that I found to be true over the years. Now uh, I've been teaching and training for a long time. And, you know, learning a traditional style, if you're interested in following the sort of traditional path, you know, from white belt to black belt, second, third, fourth degree, et cetera, and beyond, and all the different things that you have to learn as part of a structured martial arts system, you know, that can take time. And that is a big commitment that a lot of people don't have the interest or the time or maybe the money to do today. Mm -hmm. But being able to master some sort of basic proficiency can be done with, you know, proper instruction and it can be done, you know, in a relatively short period of time. And I guess that's kind of what you try to do, right? Absolutely. So, you know, a lot, unfortunately when I go to a lot of seminars, it's, I get two hours maybe if I'm lucky with a group of people who may not go on for any further training. So I try to limit what I teach them to, as you pointed out, really what are the most basic or some common strikes that they could practice on their own and try and instill in them the fact that, sure, you've been here for two hours, but that doesn't mean you can just do this, go home and go, hey, I'm safe now. I don't have to do anything more. Um, they need to make sure they practice and keep thinking about these things uh, on a regular basis. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's De- – Definitely. So practice is such an important thing, Pete. Don't you agree? And I'll say I guess if both Pete's will agree on this, that, you know, thinking about practice makes perfect. If we're not going to learn some sort of art, or learn certain trainings. If we don't follow through and we learn and keep practicing, we're not going to become better at it, right? Like with anything, absolutely. Yep, and, you know, one of the the things that, and I'll get a little bit more into this uh, a little later on in in the interview, but uh, learning not just some techniques, but also discovering some of the things that you can carry with you that give you an edge are imperative, especially for somebody who doesn't have a lot of training, because these sort of things can really amplify your capabilities. And, and we'll kind of leave that hanging out there, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but uh, let's, let's dive into some of the questions I have. Now, what your, uh, your company, your uh, solution here, Best Defense Concepts, what is the, the issue, the, the, the core issue that you're attempting to solve with Best Defense Concepts? Um. I guess kind of what we're saying, which really is trying to impart on people some basic knowledge that they can use and continue to practice at home for you know the rest of their lives, essentially. Because if they don't, as you pointed out, have the time, the money, or the wherewithal to go to classes, as most people don't because they have so many other obligations, I try to take what I've learned from the different arts, distill it down, and say, look, if you learned just these three things and you practice this, along with situational awareness and using good common sense you're going to probably remain safe, keep yourself as safe as possible. So that's really my focus, trying to move away from the martial arts um, kind of way of doing things where it's going to require all this 
training and uh, testing and that kind of thing and just focus on what is simple and practical and what is effective. So you lay out specifically enough specific what types of certain situations when you're talking about self-defense that happen to people when they really do need to utilize this, when it, they might be the average person that might only run into this once or twice in their lives, but they'll be ready and prepared and look at those types of situations and train people to be able to handle those situations. It might be just walking away so that they don't, they can stay safe, right? That's absolutely true. You know, the first thing you tell people is if you can avoid a situation, you should absolutely avoid it because getting involved in the confrontation, as Pete has already pointed out, I have no idea what this person is capable of, what they want to do. Do they have a weapon? Do they have friends? I don't know any of these things. So if I choose to engage with someone, it could be a very bad mistake because they may be willing to to kill me or, or badly hurt me when maybe if I just would have walked away, it wouldn't have escalated and we would have had no problems and I'd live another day. Yep. It's, uh, it, it's scary because, you know, there are a lot of unstable people and for one reason or another, they may be having a bad day. They may be off their medication. They just might be a little nuts. They may yeah. be, who knows what's going on in their life. And if you happen to be that spark that sets them off, you know, it's going to get real bad real fast. So, you know, one of the things that I always preach to people before we even touch a single self-defense technique or even start getting into anything physical is talk about the mental side of it mm -hmm. and developing the, the mindset of somebody that understands that when you make that decision, you have to commit 110% with every ounce of your being and with the sort of drive and focus that you are not going to fail. It is going to be something where you are going to prevail. You're going to do whatever it takes to go over, under, through, or around, whatever that obstacle is in front of you. If that person is, you know, trying to rob you or, you know, accost you or assault you or attempt to rape you or whatever, that you make that commitment that you're the one that's going to be home, going home to their family, and that person's going to have the bad day. And to be able to change that mindset in people is something that's very difficult to do because if you're never sort of in that situation or you haven't had a really official training on that or talk to somebody who understands and can impart that knowledge to you, I could teach people the coolest wet techniques in the world. Right. But if they can't bring themselves to execute them, what good is it? Right. No, no. Right. right. That's so true. I mean – because once it happens, when these situations happen, that's why we carry insurance. That's why we protect ourselves in specific ways. If when it finally it's showtime and you're not ready because you didn't prepare, even though you went through all that process to learn it, but did not really think about the confidence you need to be able to handle this situation, right? Yeah. And it's, it's the same thing. I agree. When I talk to people I see at seminars, I say that the first thing you have to decide for yourself is what are you prepared to do? And you should understand that now you don't want to make that, try and make that decision under pressure where it's going to be too difficult to make it. You need to know now, if I, am I willing to do whatever it takes? How much, how much force am I willing to use? Am I willing to use lethal force? Make that piece now with yourself so that when you have to, defend yourself, you'll know exactly what you're capable or willing to do um, and not leaving it to the last minute when it's not going to be possible to make that decision. It's one of the things that I teach in uh, my warrior mindset training, which is you have to have the mindset of a warrior and you have to think about what you just said, Peter, is those contingencies before they happen. Because if you have already, like you said, you've made peace with yourself, you've already said, look, when this happens, and not if, it's when this happens to me, this is what, how I'm going to react and this is what I'm going to do. And so you've already made that decision and you already have taken away the thought process from having to make the, any sort of decision when you're under duress at the, quote, speed of fight. Because right. as we know, when things are happening, they are happening so quickly. And if you hesitate for even a second or a split second, that could be the difference between living and dying, being hurt or killed, you know, or, you know, having serious injury or being able to thwart an attack. Right. And these are things that have to be taught first 
they have, people have to think about it. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people, both in law enforcement as well as in the military and other branches of service, they don't get what I believe is the right amount of mental training. They're taught, okay, this is how you shoot the gun. This is how you put the bullets in the target. You know, this is how you maybe do an escort technique. You know, right. when you come across a perpetrator, this is how you cuff somebody. This is how you use your baton, et cetera. But they're not thinking, okay, your partner has a gun to his head and there's a barrier preventing you from getting to them. Mm-hmm. You've got a clean shot. Do you take it? Right. Well, until right. somebody has actually yeah. thought about that situation, you don't want to be thinking about that when you're there. Right. You've got to think ahead of time. Absolutely. I'm taking that shot. My partner is my partner. If the other person doesn't go home that day and they go away in a body bag, but my partner and I get to, you know, protect people tomorrow and the day after the day after, then yeah. that's the piece you make with yourself. Yeah. hundred percent agree. Um, and I think the other bit of that too is not only understanding that part of it, but also realizing that the stress of a situation is going to make it far more difficult. So as you said, if I'm in a, a dojo and I've got my gi on and we're practicing these techniques and there's no real stress, I can practice that all day long, but unless you actually incorporate some stress training into what you're doing, and that's what I think Krav Maga is very good at, um, it becomes less realistic and it's, it's better. You'll learn to do the techniques better and you'll feel more confident if you do add that stress element to it, closing your eyes, having the lights turned off, loud music on, disorientation, to make it as realistic as possible so that I'm, I'm not completely surprised when I am attacked. Um, right. And that's, that's very important because yeah. the, yeah. the duress is different. When you get that adrenaline dump, yeah. you lose your fine motor skills, you get tunnel vision, your hearing goes, things change. The world slows down. Things sort of happen in, you know, very, very strange. And people that have never experienced that, you can't explain it <laughs> to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. You have to yeah. experience it. Yeah. So what wow. motivated you to start learning uh, martial arts, Peter? You know, it was um, it's just as when I was in um, high school, just kind of being weaker than I think the other kids were, just feeling like I was getting pushed around, not really bullied in a really bad way, but just not feeling like I could defend myself. And I didn't, I liked that confidence. And I thought, you know, maybe martial arts would be one of those ways to instill that confidence in me. Uh, and that's, you know, so I looked around and I found my first instructor, John McSweeney, who was, who was great uh, and kind of had me. From that point on, I kind of saw martial arts, I think, from a different perspective, maybe, than people do in traditional sense, because you didn't have a traditional school. Mm -hmm. But that's what kind of got me started. And ever since then, I just kind of kept it up because, number one, it interests me. And two, uh, I hate traditional exercise, and it's a great way to exercise and keep fit, you know, so. Did you love it? Do you love, did you love it when you first started? This is like, this is for me, I want to keep doing this? I did, you know, it really was something that was really interesting and different and exciting. And then the longer you did it, you know, the more, the more intricate the, the things you could see, techniques, and then once you started seeing the world of martial arts as not just being a style, but more of, I have so many other things I can learn from other people and other uh, ways of thinking, it just became even more interesting to me. So over time, I'm, I try to, so many people will get focused and say, well, I am a Kempo person, I'm a Taekwondo person, like, that's great, but, you know, there's so much more to learn, uh, why not go out there and learn more from different people and expand your horizons. Oh yeah. You pull stuff from everywhere. If you, you know, if you like to learn and you're a teacher, uh, a teacher's responsibility to their student is to impart the proper knowledge to that student. One technique from one style isn't going to work for every one of your students. And so having sort of a really deep well to pull from is really important. And that's, that's one reason why I've studied multiple arts as well, because it gives you a wide range. And, and studying like a hard style like Taekwondo and a soft style like Hapkido, you, and, and for people who don't understand that, um, I'll explain it very briefly, but a hard style is something that's very linear, like karate and Taekwondo are very linear right. styles. You know, linear punches, linear kicks. A soft style like Hapkido or Aikido or Jiu-Jitsu, they use your opponent's energy against them. And so basically the harder and faster com- that somebody comes at you, the harder and faster you send them into the wall or the floor or, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. So it's a really great way to blend. And so those are just two kind of examples. But, you know, then you've got things like, you know, real, more real world styles like Krav Maga, which I pulled a lot of stuff of my, my knife defense stuff from. And I know you've, you've done a lot of that as well. So what inspired uh, you to start teaching? Uh, you know, so I, after been doing martial arts for a number of years and then going to different schools and seeing how people were teaching, I'm like, you know, 
I think I could do a really good job teaching people as well. And in a sense, you are, because as a student, as a more advanced student, you're teaching people uh, that you're working with. But of course, you want to teach things in your own way. And the instructors don't like you really putting your spin on things sometimes. So I'm like, you know, at some point, I just have to start teaching my own way. So that's really what pushed me out there. I'm like, you know, I like teaching. I like working with people and I like giving them those skills. Yeah, and that's where um, if you're in a traditional school, they don't want you to deviate from the curriculum. No. And so you you run into that. Now, as a teacher, what did you think was one of your best strengths when you started teaching martial arts? It's actually, I think, my best strength when it comes to both being an attorney as well as being an instructor is that I feel that I have a very good – command of explaining things to people in a way they can easily understand. I mean, one of the biggest compliments I get as an attorney is you don't sound like an attorney when you explain things to me. I'm like, well, that's great because, you know, I want you to understand it. I want to fill it up with a lot of technical legal ease. Uh, it's the same with martial arts. If you can, if you can explain to people what you need them to do and why what they're doing is wrong or how it needs to be corrected in a way that they can relate to, they'll get it faster. I found many instructors lack that ability to convey the information. They're just like, well, you're doing it wrong. Like, well, that's not very helpful. You need more, more than that. And you have to relate to each person individually. So uh, I think that's one of my biggest skills. And I've seen over the years, a lot of people, you know, as soon as they go and they get their black belt, they think they can go open up a martial arts school. Yeah. Just because you receive an advanced, really a black belt isn't that advanced, but when you receive an advanced degree in a martial art, that doesn't automatically make you a good teacher along the way. You're supposed to instruct as a way of enhancing your own knowledge, because I mean, in anything, if you're teaching something, you end up learning it more completely. So that's one reason why you're basically required to do some sort of instruction when you're taking traditional martial arts. But it's funny because like you said, a lot of guys are like, well, you're just, you're doing it wrong. It's not supposed to be like that. Okay. Well then show me, show me the proper way to do it. And if you can't show me the proper way to do it, what are you doing trying to teach this for? Yes. And, uh, and that, that exactly. makes me crazy. I mean, I always try to, if I, if I'm demonstrating and I'm telling somebody what to do, I do it. Yeah. It doesn't matter yeah. if I'm doing some crazy technique that's, that's complicated or difficult. I mean, thank God I can still do everything I need to do, <laughs> you know, right. at some point I won't be able to, but you know, you have to be able to demonstrate and say, no, 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 no. You have to do it like this or like that, or this is why it's not working. And here's the reason why. And then you let people know that and they're like, oh, okay. Now I understand why what I was just doing isn't going to work. Or is it working as well. And how challenging is it to teach martial arts self defense, especially for people that just can't are afraid to defend themselves or do not think they're ever going to need to defend themselves? Those are two different types of people, of students, but those definitely are out there. Well, you know that's true, and you know when the people come to the to my seminars or I go to teach at, you know, whatever environment is, whether it's a school or an office, you know, you're going to have those different types of questions that are going to kind of lead you to understand these people are reluctant or, you know, they don't really know why they should have these skills. And you, you try to convey, or at least I do, I try to convey that through, through stories, things that have happened in the paper, you know, um, stories from other students or other attendees have told me that things have happened to them. And I think by explaining those, um, the skills that they need uh, through these uh, stories about real people and how they've used self-defense to defend themselves. People who've never used, uh, actually, maybe have never had to use real self-defense, but they ended up defending themselves well anyway. Uh, that sometimes gets through to people. And, you know, you're never sure because maybe, again, I only see these people one time, but I'm hoping that I've made some impact on them with, the, with that kind of presentation. What's the range of uh, student ages that you teach? Do you teach children? Is it mostly adults? Uh, all, everywhere in between? What's the sort of the age range? So I uh, generally try not to go lower than high school because since I'm so more focused on reality-based self-defense, I don't feel real comfortable teaching younger kids, so I stick to high school age. Uh, but it goes up to seniors. I do have a lot of senior groups out here that are very interested, and so I've gone to a number of senior centers uh, on a regular basis, and I usually get a pretty good showing for those. So they're one of the most interesting groups to work with. They're very excited. They want to hit everything as hard as they can. And you give them a cane in their hand, you better watch out because they're just going to start swinging. So um, 
It, they're they're a great group. I really enjoy <laughs> teaching the seniors a lot. So. And when you teach them self defense, what have been some of the success stories or a story that you could share without saying who it is for a senior <laughs> that's defended themselves? Because you think about kids, you know, they might run away, they might, you know, do something, or you think about women that are like not as large as the perpetrator. But when you think about senior citizens, mm -hmm. you really don't think about them defending themselves. No, it's true. And, and they don't think, you know, until they come to the seminar, they don't think about it either. I think a lot of people come because they're like, well, it's interesting. And I do a lot of these for free. They're like, well, I'll just show up. And then by the end, they're like, wow, I never thought about using my cane as a weapon. They're like, well, it's, it's a great weapon. It's out. Why not think about using it as a weapon? Um, you but, can do amazing things with a cane. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is. It's incredible. And it goes everywhere you go. Airports, courthouses, right? It's not a weapon. It's a medical device. So you tell these people that you should think about carrying it, even if you may not need it per se, and you've got yourself a weapon ready to go. Uh, as far as success stories, I haven't had anyone tell me that they were afterwards that they've been attacked, but I've had people tell me that they have felt far more confident and ready to protect themselves and that they've gotten to the mindset now where they're looking around, they're paying attention, they're looking at people and they're watching. And for me, that's great because that's like, to me, you know, 75% of the self-defense is really paying attention to what's going on around you. And if they're doing that, I think they're going to stay out of trouble. So. Your distractions are deadly. Yeah. And they, they can be, you know, especially with technology and how it distracts people and just being busy. You know, people are caught up in whatever's going on in their life at that particular point in time. And if they're not being aware of what's going on around them, the people, the places, the objects, the, you know, the environment that they're in, sure. that can end up being something that's extremely dangerous if they're not prepared for, for a problem. Um, now, I get this sometimes from people, so I'm going to have to ask you this as well. <laughs> um, people like to ask about things that they can carry to defend themselves. And I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of the show, sure. which is, you know, self-defense weapons for everyday carry. And I have a yeah. free guide that I have written about this. Got about 20 different things in there that I talk about. Um, the two biggest are obviously probably a knife and a gun. Yep. So we'll start right with that. First of all, first, first part of the question will be, do you advocate that people carry a knife or a gun or some other sort of self-defense item? Uh, well, I guess I start with, uh, so I am a concealed carry holder, and so I do carry occasionally a firearm, although Illinois is extremely restrictive on places you cannot carry, so I can't always carry with me. Uh, I do carry a knife as often as I can as well, but I can't always carry those when I go on trips and, and on the courthouses, so I can't always carry the things I would like to carry, so I do advocate that people carry something, and I tell people that it's got to be something that you're going to carry with you frequently so that you are comfortable using and that you're going to know how to access. So for me, I tell people it can be anything from a flashlight that you can have in your hand, for good for blinding people as well as for an impact weapon. It could be uh, as simple and as cheap as a, a Sharpie marker, which is very durable and fits in your hand and will go through security without any problem. Um, learning how to use a key on your key ring. You know, I tell people to buy an extra big key that they can use with held, held right. It can be used for slashing or stabbing. Um, and, you know, there are, of course, the Kuboton, which I carry. Uh, I have a keychain. Again, can't go through airport security. It's, you know, uh, specifically forbidden from going on airplanes, but I carry it everywhere else with me, and I think that's a great tool. I advocate that uh, for people. For people uh, that don't know what a kubaton is, it's a small metal bar about six inches long. Some are blunt and on both ends. Other ones have a little bit of a taper on the end, but they are impact weapons that can amplify your striking capability many times and focus Absolutely. it. Yeah. So yes, they're awesome. And they can be used as a leverage weapon because you can yes. actually use them as a leverage weapon for different types of uh, finger joint locks, wrist locks, things of that nature. Um, Personal self-defense items, I always tell people that there are a couple different kinds that you have. There's passive, you know, defense items like a flashlight, right? Sure. It's not hitting anybody. It's not touching anybody, but it's blinding them. You know, uh, a high lumen value flashlight with a strobe function is going to disorient anybody. Yes. If they can't see you, they can't attack you. Mm -hmm. um, pepper spray is a great one to punch with that. I tell people, have your defensive flashlight and have your pepper spray. You blind them with the flashlight so they can't see. Now you take your pepper spray out, hit them in the eyes, and now you can run. There right? you go. So <laughs> the little one-two punch there. Um, and then, you know, so distance weapons would be like pepper spray. Um, passive items, things like uh, whistles 
Right. Right. You, you know, they have these uh, these whistles that are extremely loud that can, you know, uh, you've got personal safety devices. We had a gentleman on our show a couple weeks ago. Uh, one of these things, you know, they can trigger incredibly loud alarms, which is going to, you know, bring uh, attention to you, to the area. Right. And many times, you know, eight out of 10 times, that person's going to hear that alarm. They're going to turn around and run away because they don't yes. want to have that attention being brought to them. Um. Then of course we have yeah, the things like the, the active, yeah. actual, you know, the active weapons. Like you're, you know, you're talking about like uh, things like uh, a kubaton, where you'd actually have to get up close and personal yep. with somebody to use it. And same thing with like a knife. Obviously, a gun is a distance weapon, but not everybody can carry, is willing to carry, or is able to carry. Uh, I've been a concealed weapons holder for over 20 years. I carry everywhere, other yeah. than like a federal courthouse or right. you know a federal building. But I mean, if I leave the house, it's on me. Hmm. And why? Because I can, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, if I run into somebody that's got a gun, at least I got a level playing field. You right. know what now, I mean? now, here's the here's the point I'm going to make about, uh, you know, when you have a knife or you have a gun, you got to be ready to use it if possible, and that's when you should carry it, those two. And you got to be trained and be yeah. trained. Yeah. The scariest yeah, but- thing is having somebody go get a concealed weapon permit and then have no training, load it up, put it in a holster, and start carrying it. Right. That to me scares the living daylights out of me because they're as much at risk of hurting themselves or someone around them they're trying to protect as right. they are to you know hurt or you know injure the or kill the bad guy. Yeah, and and the other problem I have is I I tell people I said you you have if you carry a knife or a gun that's great. Number one, make sure you're trained, not just shooting at paper targets. Go out and do tactical shooting. Learn how to draw under pressure. A lot of stuff that people don't think about, like you said, right. I get my permit, carry my holster. It's all good. Um, and then also equally important, understand the law. And when you're allowed to pull your weapon, I'm most just going to go you, there. So I'm glad you're going there. Yeah. So just, you don't just pull out your gun and start shooting at people because they pissed you off. You know, it better be a lethal threat. And if you're pulling your gun, you probably should be using it not just pulling it out and waving it around at people. So that's aggravated assault. <laughs> See, now you're going to go to jail. So, so yeah. and the thing is with, with proper training, how many times do you think you're gonna, Pete, have had you had to use it? How many times have you had to pull it out, being concealed and carried for that long? Pete? How many times? Never, 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 and nobody oh. ever knows I have it because I always carry concealed. I can open carry in the state of Pennsylvania, but why would I? You're just gonna oh. make people nervous. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you have to understand the only time you can use it is the threat of being killed, raped, serious bodily injury, or kidnapping. That's yeah. about it. Yeah. Right. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, Peter. No, that's right. Absolutely. So, so I mean, people think, oh, you know, somebody's in my house and they're robbing me. I can pull out my gun and I can shoot them. No, you can't. Right. You can, you're going to find yourself in jail. Yeah. And then people are like, well, wait a minute. I'm just protecting my property. Well, the, your property isn't going to get hurt or killed. You can right. go file an insurance claim and get back your jewelry or your TV or your PlayStation or whatever it else happens to be, you know, being stolen. You can call 911, but you can't pull your gun out and start shooting people. You know, Absolutely. same thing. You know, somebody makes you nervous. You can't pull a gun out and, and hold them at bay. You're going to find yourself being arrested for aggravated assault because you pointed a gun at them. And yeah. like you said, you pull that gun out, you better be ready to shoot it. And that should be the reason why you're shooting. And you yeah. better be aware of what's right, not in front of you, but also what's behind that target. Mm-hmm. People don't think that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to shoot. Okay, well, great. You just made a shot in your house, went through your wall, and it just hit your kid because it yes. went through the, the, uh, the sheetrock in the house. But yeah, you know, exactly. People don't think about any of this, so they have to get trained. I mean, I'm a very strong advocate for the Second Amendment and for carrying, mm-hmm. but do not carry without getting some training. And I think everybody should have the equivalent of the Act 235, yes. the weapons training that so, I've had, so because they need to know when you can use it and how to use it. So yeah. if you have to get certified to teach as a teacher, why can't there be a stronger certification to be a gun holder, to carry a gun? Why Some states have that. Other states don't. Yeah. State of Pennsylvania, anybody can walk into a courthouse with a clean record, walk out half an hour, 45 minutes later with a permit to carry. Oh, wow. Okay. No training required. Florida? Okay. No. As, a, as an example. I don't know how it is in, in, you're in Illinois. I don't know how it is there, but I know in Florida, you have to have some sort of minimal uh, instruction before you can carry concealed. It is very minimal here as well. I think you got to fire uh, 30 shots and that's it. And, you know. That, um, yeah, that anyone can do that obviously so that's crazy yeah but it just underscores the the well you know there's kind of two things there number one is you know how many people can carry that aren't qualified to carry right. and then you know number two is you don't know who can be who is carrying 
right? right? It could be somebody who's carrying that shouldn't be, you mm-hmm. know, and they're the bad guy, you know, and they, even if they had to go through some training, guess what? Even if they're not able to legally purchase a gun, guess what? They still probably have one because they bought it on the black market and they have no <laughs> qualms about pulling it out and, uh, and using it. So you got to protect yourself. So, um, you mentioned a Kubaton, uh, which I also like, um, there's a, I mean, there's so many things. I mean, there's, you know, sap caps and monkey yep. fists and people are like, what are those? You know, monkey fists, a little ball bearing wrapped in, in uh, paracord. Right. About this long. Whack somebody. Man, does that hurt? Somebody grabs you, you hit them, that is going to leave a mark <laughs> and they're yep. not going to forget about it. So there's lots of non-lethal. I mean, pepper spray is obviously a big one. Yes. Uh, distance weapon, non-lethal, going to incapacitate most people, not everybody, but most people and yep. allow you to escape. Uh. So from a from again going back to the kind of the legal side of this, can you give us kind of a summary of the the laws surrounding self defense? Can you you know go into any more detail than what I sort of briefly mentioned? Well, or you know if you look at it, it's it's really basic, right? You have to have a reasonable belief that someone intends to harm you, right? So reasonable belief. Right. It has to be imminent, so it's got to be something that's going to happen right now, right? And then the force that you use has to be no greater than what's being used against you. So if someone's using less than lethal force, my force has to be less than lethal. Anything lethal, then obviously pretty much anything goes. But, you know, while you can explain it that simply, it's just a whole gray area because nothing is simple when it comes to the law. Uh, And unless someone's pulling out a gun and shooting at you, you know, less than lethal force can be a wide range of things. Um, So what I try and tell my students is that while it is a gray area, really what you look at is how do I stop a threat and then once the threat is stopped, I stop attacking the person so I don't end up committing, you know, a crime. I don't use excessive force. So I don't go past what self-defense allows. So use enough force to stop the threat and get away. That should be enough um, to justify what I'm doing and be able to explain why you did what you did. Exactly. exactly. So it's just, it's scary. It's a scary thing. So you want to teach people specifically that they shouldn't have any fear. They should know they're trying to protect themselves. But last case scenario when it comes to a gun or knife, using it, right, in your opinion, unless you're, you're, your life's in danger. And defining that's a, hard, uh, is a fine line, isn't it? There's no question about it because, we, as we were mentioning before, with, with the stress and the adrenaline and you're in this fight where you've probably never been in a, an extreme situation like this before and now you're trying to decide, should I pull out my weapon and should I be using my weapon? You look at the police who have had training in this specifically and they have trouble doing it regular people are going to have more so um so yeah really again it's that training component working on the stress trying to understand how i'm going to deal with it mentally realizing there's going to be difficult situations difficult decisions to make it's a lot really and you know so that's why self-defense is you try and convince people or make them understand it's more than just punching and kicking there's a there's so much more to it than that that is actually the smallest part of it while it is also a fun part of it uh but it is a small part and you need to understand all of it to really protect yourself legally morally you know uh ethically everything every other way exactly because the mental side of it is so as i you know i was saying is such a big part of it i mean i think 80 percent of self-defense is mental yeah. Because you could take somebody that has absolutely no training, but they have 110% commitment to the outcome that is required and they can overcome somebody and it, they don't need self-defense training, but they had the commitment yep. from a, on a mental standpoint. So then you could have somebody that has the training, but doesn't have the ability to make that sort of mental commitment and really fully do what needs to be done. And they're the ones that are going to get hurt or killed or worse. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, well, not worse than kill, but you know, hurt, yeah. rape, whatever. Uh, because of that. And so knowing that you need the mindset that allows you to execute with full commitment, whatever that technique is, whether it's a martial arts technique, a, a kick, a punch, uh, uh, you know, some sort of lock, move, you know, joint lock, whatever, uh, or using some sort of weapon, whether it's a knife or a gun or some other, you know, less lethal device, um, you have to make that commitment and having the forethought to understand what is required, having the training, and then ha- once you have that training, now you have the, the confidence. Right. And many times simply having the confidence that comes with a little bit of training allows most situations to be diffused. 
Right. Because the person that you're dealing with senses the confidence and they go, I maybe shouldn't mess with this person because they're not being intimidated by what's going on here yeah. because they've been trained and they know they're confident. You, and or if it's just you're walking down the street and you're holding yourself a certain way where you're looking up, you know, you look in the world in the, in the eye, you know, in the eyes and you're walking straight ahead as opposed to, you know, somebody who's kind of down and, you know, not looking real confidently and they're not looking around and not paying attention. Well, guess what? <laughs> you're making yourself out to be an easy victim. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what, what do you, what do you think in terms of your experience with training different people, of different skill sets, uh, especially with a lot of people without any sort of formal training, what do you think the hardest thing is that you have come up against? Or what is the toughest thing that you've come up against when you're trying to teach somebody self-defense? Um, you know, I, one of the one, actually one of the things that I get the most pushback against sometimes is particularly when I talk about one of the uh, targets I like to attack, which are the eyes. One of the eyes are a really great target. A lot of people can, you know, if you're a senior, it doesn't matter. You got some fingers, you can stick a finger in the eye. It's a very simple technique. But then I get a lot of people telling me that doesn't seem right or I don't feel right attacking the eyes. And like, well, you're being attacked by someone who's trying to hurt you. So that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. Attacking by the eyes. That's another way of defending yourself. And yeah. so I did the fake eyes when I was a professional wrestler. So I just will just go gouge them out if somebody comes after me and <laughs> kind of just retool myself to just go ahead and just say, well, I'm, I'm shooting now. This is real. And if yeah. you come in, you grab somebody in that fake headlock, if you make it a real headlock and you get to their throat, guess what? They're not moving. Yeah. You do certain things. And then a lot of times the people who attack you are not the people that you set up for a setup for a fight. Like, hey, I'm fighting you later today. They right. know you. But when it's somebody that's an attacker, their mindset is nothing. So you can really surprise them because they're all thinking about just injury they're not being very strategic, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, soft targets, I tell my students, you follow the center line of the body. Yeah. The eyes are good. The problem is most people could not bring themselves to gouge out someone's eyes. I mean, yeah. bottom line, they can't do it. If, if you, yeah. Even if you're being strangled to death, yeah. can you take and force your fingers right into somebody's eye sockets? Most people can't do that. I don't care yeah. what kind of training you have. It's good to kind of poke them in the eyes, maybe get them yeah. to do this, but can yeah. you really do what needs to be done? Maybe, maybe not. I'm yeah. going to say more often than not, not. Yeah. Throat, though. I don't care how big and strong you are. True. You hit somebody in the throat, above the Adam's apple, drive it down. You have the little soft pressure point right above the, yep. the breastbone. You could easily, especially ladies with those long fingernails, man, you dig oh, yeah. something in down there, that person's yeah. going to the ground. Obviously, the groin. The knees are a great target, especially for someone who is small, not that strong, or elderly. Mm-hmm. Straight kick right to the front of a kneecap, you dislocate the kneecap. Guess what? Person falls down, you get to hobble away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Even right. Senior. You don't have to sprint away. Somebody yeah. with a dislocated kneecap is not running after you. True. So depending on the person who's doing the self-defense, you know, you follow the center line and you try to hit the targets that make the most sense, um, you know, whether it's boxing the ears, the eyes, the throat, the groin, right. the solar plexus, the knees, and... Uh, and hopefully that's what it takes for you to live to see another day. Yeah. No, and and the, the one I'd add to that is the shins. I think the shins are often overlooked because you can kick the shins without much effort whatsoever. It's a very low target. You got two of them. It's even better when you got a cane you can whack them in the shins with. So Very uh, sensitive area because yeah. such a little bit of skin over the, the shin. It hurts like a son yeah. of a gun. <laughs> it does. Um, I'll, uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Um, what, um, are you working on any sort of interesting current projects right now? Anything new in the in the in the realm of uh, of your world with your company and your training? Well, yeah, what I'm trying to do is so I've got uh, my first instructor, John McSweeney, who was a student of Ed Parker's, uh, studied Kempo. So he wrote a book called Street Karate, and in his book, Street Karate, he um, cataloged essentially um, I figure how many it was like 30 some attacks that actually occurred, and then the self defense that was used in those attacks. So he has some pictures. He's got some description of the attacks. Um, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take that book and I want to make a video companion to kind of go with that to show what he did or what they did in the book and then what I would propose if I was going to teach it myself because I don't always wouldn't always teach the same things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it would be a great book and video because I don't think there's anything out there right now. I, I'm always looking at for books on martial arts and I don't have to look at mine then because I did exactly what you're talking about. Did you? Okay. Learn self-defense online.com. 
Oh, okay. He's a video companion to the first book I wrote, which was the Self-Defense Survival Guide. Excellent. So I'll have to get you a copy of that, and you can check out the site, because that's exactly what I did. It's a companion. So you read okay. the book, you yep. look at the techniques, and you look at the pictures, then you go online, and you can watch the video. Nice. Okay. That's perfect. So there you go. I got to talk to you after this then. <laughs> <laughs> um, any last thoughts for our listeners today, Peter? Uh, you know, I think uh, we've covered all the real important points, which is go out there, learn some basic self-defense, learn the law, um, be aware, and just keep practicing, and you're going to keep yourself as safe as you possibly can be. Excellent. Any last thoughts, Neil? Well, well, well Pete, uh, I le the, at least the, the B problems are done for today. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is it just makes me think, I don't think I need a weapon, and I'm not saying that in a way, but I guess in a lot of ways my size can do that intimidation. And if I am confronted by a gun or certain things, I'm going to run like anything. Yeah. Or, or I'm going to gouge the eyes or run or I don't know. It, whatever it is, I will be aware of it possibly happening because you're going to be able to spot these things. You're going to be spotting someone that seems crazy, seems really not in the right position because if they're going to do something crazy and I just got to identify it and get the hell out. That's yeah. it. There's, there's no reason I, I don't put myself in specific positions where I'm at a certain bar that doesn't look like they find me kindly to be there or certain things. I'm watching things way before it could happen. Sure. Now see in your situation though, being a bigger guy, somebody who is thinking about doing something is going to go right to a weapon. Because yeah. they know, guess what? I'm probably going to lose if I try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy because he's big, he's strong, and I'm not going to probably win. So that's where you'd have to be more careful is that somebody would be much more apt to pull a knife or a gun or some other sort of weapon because if they were looking to, you know, to harm you – going at you with punches and kicks probably is not going to work too well. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, always, uh, always good having our guests on and, uh, Peter, thanks so much. And, uh, thanks for being on the show and thanks to our listeners for tuning in and you can always get more information and the latest news about safety from our website, safetytalkpodcast.com, which is not only a website that provides links to our past episodes, but also provides the latest news about safety. So until next time, everybody, stay safe.